I'd like to call the uh, subcommittee back to order. Uh, appreciate everyone's uh, patience in uh, dealing with the votes. We ended up with uh, first they said one, then they said three, and we ended up with two. So uh, we should have some other members returning, but we're going to go ahead and take off. Uh, where I'm sorry, uh, continue as to where we. Uh, left off, and uh, I think we left off with Mr. Feldman, and we're going to go to Mr. Ratner now. Mr. Uh, Stephen Ratner is chairman of Willett Advisors. Uh, welcome, sir, and you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It is sometimes difficult to recall that just five years ago the American auto industry was in a severe crisis that threatened its very existence and the broader American economy. It is incontrovertible that absent government intervention, both General Motors and Chrysler would have been forced to cease production, close their doors, and lay off virtually all their workers. These shutdowns would have reverberated through the entire auto sector, causing innumerable, innumerable suppliers to almost immediately also stop operating. More than a million jobs would have been lost, at least for a time. Michigan and the entire industrial Midwest would have been devastated. Everything we did in the government at that time was driven by our profound desire to prevent such an economic calamity while honoring our responsibilities to the taxpayers. And by any objective measure, I believe our efforts were a success. Today, General Motors is once again profitable and healthy. It has gone from a company that was hemorrhaging money before the financial crisis to one that turned a $1.2 billion profit in its most recent quarter, driven by strong North American sales. The restructuring of GM's contract with the United Auto Workers provided the company with new flexibility to use its workforce efficiently and expanded its ability to hire new workers at considerably lower costs. And GM has vastly improved its product lineup so that it is once again selling the kinds of cars consumers want to buy and demonstrating the power of American ingenuity, engineering, and manufacturing. At the same time, the government is successfully winding down its ownership stake in GM and returning the company to private hands. Of the $51 billion that the taxpayers invested in GM, more than $34 billion has been repaid to the Treasury. And Treasury has stated that further GM stock sales are planned in the coming year. This makes clear that the government's actions were a necessary and prudent emergency measure to get GM back on its feet, not a permanent government takeover of private industry, as some at the time feared. This remarkable turnaround could not have occurred without significant restructuring at GM, a restructuring that regrettably but inevitably involved painful sacrifices from all of GM's stakeholders, but particularly its bondholders, dealers, suppliers, employees, and retirees. It is not easy to make these kinds of decisions under any circumstances. It was particularly challenging in the crisis atmosphere that GM was facing at the time. No one wants to get cents on the dollar of their investment or have their dealership closed or see their incomes or benefits reduced. These are personal pocketbook issues for those affected and unfair almost by definition. To understand the decisions that were made, I believe it is important to appreciate that the auto task force had two overriding goals, to restore a viable and thriving auto industry while acting as a prudent custodian of taxpayer funds. To achieve these goals, we were guided by the principle that Treasury, as GM's investor and partner in bankruptcy, was entitled to set parameters and provide guidance to GM that was consistent with what be, would be commercially reasonable. In accordance with that principle, the Auto Task Force helped GM determine the broad strategic policies that would return the company to competitiveness at the least cost and risk to, to taxpayers. Day-to-day -day management remained the responsibility of GM. I know the subcommittee is interested in one of those decisions in particular, which was GM's decision to honor a preexisting commitment to provide supplemental bene pension benefits or top-ups to certain hourly employees at Delphi, a critical GM parts supplier that was itself in bankruptcy. Other hourly employees and salaried employees at Delphi were not provided similar top-ups. Although I fully understand that it was painful for the salaried employees who saw their pensions cut and perhaps made more painful by the fact that some of their hourly colleagues did receive top-ups, I believe the Special Inspector General's report makes clear that GM's decision to honor its top-up agreement in bankruptcy was consistent with a commercially reasonable approach. The Delphi hourly employees who received top-ups were differently situated from the salaried employees who did not, 
for reasons that predated GM's bankruptcy and the work of the Auto Task Force. GM had fully funded the salaried employees' pensions, but not the hourly employees' pensions, before the Delphi spinoff spin in 1999. At that time, the hourly employees negotiated for a top-up agreement from GM, but the salaried employees who were fully funded did not. As the Special Inspector General's report explains, GM was therefore under no obligation to top up the salaried employee's pension, and indeed doing so on its own initiative would have been like, been like paying for the pensions twice. Such an action, while generous, would not have been consistent with the goals of restoring, the GM, of restoring GM to viability or protecting U.S. taxpayers' investment. It is certainly true that in bankruptcy GM had the option of refusing to honor its agreement to top up the hourly workers' pensions as well. Again, I think the Special Inspector General's report makes clear that its decision to honor the prior agreement was consistent with what was commercially reasonable. Those employees were represented by the UAW, the same union that represented 99%, represents 99 percent of GM's unionized workforce. The UAW was an absolutely critical party to bring to the negotiating table. They had the power to hold up a deal in bankruptcy or to strike, either of which could have been devastating to GM's efforts to get back on its feet and in turn to the U.S. economy. This disparity in bargaining leverage, leverage may not seem fair, but it was the reality. And as I mentioned earlier, GM extracted considerable concessions from the UAW in order to reduce GM's labor costs going forward and get it on a sustainable, profitable path. Five years later, I think it is clear that the government's extraordinary intervention in the American auto industry has been a success. I deeply wish that the actions we took did not have to be taken, but I am proud that we avoided a devastating dissolution of this vital sector of the economy and gave the American auto industry the opportunity to once again lead and succeed. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. We will recognize now uh, Mr. Harry Wilson, uh, Chairman and CEO of the MAVA Group. Welcome, and you are recognized. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Connolly, and members of the subcommittee, Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today on the somber anniversary of the attacks of 9-11. Uh, I am here to report your request on the 2009 auto rescues and the recent SIGTAR report on Delphi pensions. I would like to make several comments on the report. First, I believe the body of the report makes clear that General Motors management acted in a commercially reasonable manner in determining how they would treat various groups of Delphi retirees. As the report makes clear, General Motors had a choice. Option A, they could choose to not provide any funding at all for Delphi's underfunded pension plans. Option B, they could choose to fully fund, top up, or even assume all of Delphi's underfunded pension plans at great cost. Or option C, they could choose to fund or top up only the plans they needed to preserve the viability of GM's own reorganization process. As the SIGTARP report clearly shows, option A was not a viable option. GM's CEO at the time, Fritz Henderson, indicated that if the pension benefit guarantee with the UAW was not assumed by new GM, there would have been a strike, and thus it was, quote, mission impossible. On option B, GM management believed there was no commercial justification for it, which would have involved assuming the pensions of nearly 70,000 salaried and hourly pensioners, a majority of whom GM had never committed to support after the 1999 Delphi spinoff, a group that included 20,000 salaried employees, 18,675 hourly employees, and 2,000 other uh, employees. At Delphi itself, none of the prospective investors in Delphi had indicated any willingness to maintain Delphi's pension funds. So unfortunately, there was just no contractual or market-based support for option B. And that left only option C, the path GM ultimately pursued, where they agreed to assume existing top-up agreements only in cases where they felt they needed to in order to successfully emerge from bankruptcy and operate successfully thereafter. The record clearly supports these facts. However, I do need to disagree with and correct for the record Several, character, several characterizations made in the summary and conclusion sections of the SIGTARP report. First, the report makes several points criticizing the commercial approach which the auto team was tasked to utilize. For example, SIGTARP implies the auto team worked too closely with GM management in developing a viable plan for GM's restructuring. However, the facts of the time and the results since repudiate this criticism. When the auto team was first formed, GM had already failed multiple times to develop a viable plan on its own and the Treasury, and thus the American taxpayer, was funding multi-billion dollar monthly losses with no end in sight. Time was of the essence. And in that spirit, the auto team worked closely with GM management as they developed the revised viability plan, offering real-time feedback and helping speed along a process that would normally take months and would have cost tens of billions of dollars more than it ultimately did. This was exactly the type of work which the auto team had been created to do to determine if there was a path to viability for General Motors, and if so, work with management to achieve that path. The commercial success of General Motors since this work was completed is beyond dispute. 
Just last week, a Bloomberg article on the resurgence of the American auto industry stated, quote, Detroit has come full circle from bankruptcy to boom. Those fatter profits come from trimmer companies that radically restructured operations, shed debts, and overhauled their lineups. SIGTARP also argues that Treasury inadvertently created negotiating leverage for the UAW due to its aggressive timeline for the restructuring process. Nothing could be further from the truth. The UAW had enormous leverage because they represented nearly 100 percent of the GM hourly workers with the skills to manufacture cars, and they are prepared to use that clout to press certain key issues. Nothing else in the restructuring process provided them any additional leverage, nor did they need more. Furthermore, the SIGTARP report is silent on what viable alternatives, if any, there might have been to the path GM pursued. Like all choices in the real world, all the difficult decisions that were made during the auto rescues were about a series of tradeoffs of bad and less bad options. For example, SIGTARP implies the auto team should not have established such an aggressive restructuring timeline. However, all industry commentators, GM management, and the auto team itself, in fact, not a single contrary voice that I am aware of, were convinced that GM could not survive a prolonged bankruptcy. As a result, there was no viable procedural alternative to a very rapid Section 363 sale. Moreover, Section 363 sales like this have been done at times in the past for exactly these reasons. So in reality, neither GM management nor Treasury had a practical alternative, unfortunately, to the course that was followed. This is not to say that these choices were at all satisfactory. Sadly, the costs inherent in a restructuring, as difficult as General Motors, are massive and tragic. In a better world, none of these difficult and painful actions would have been necessary. However, it is equally clear that for General Motors, there is not a viable alternative path available to it, and far greater costs and tragedies were avoided as a result of the work that was done by both companies, their many advisors, and the Bush and Obama administrations. I look forward to discussing these issues with you today. Thank you. We will we'll now uh, turn to our last uh, witness, Mr. Miller. And Mr. Miller is a uh, uh, senior member of international law firm. Uh, and uh, welcome, and you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Connolly, and members of the committee for the opportunity to participate in this hearing. Uh, I acted as the lead attorney for General Motors in connection with its restructuring under Chapter 11 of the Bankruptcy Code via a sale pursuant to Section 363 to an entity sponsored and financed by the U.S. Treasury and the governments of Canada and Ontario through its Export Development Canada. During the period preceding the commencement of the Chapter 11 case, General Motors was subjected to substantial adverse circumstances. Beginning in 2007, as the subprime mortgage crisis began to surface and affect auto and truck sales, that was compounded by a surge in oil prices in the summer of 2008 and further diminished, that further diminished consumer demand and caused sales to erode. As a result, GM's liquidity began to dry up. Conditions worsened with the financial crisis ignited by the conservatorships for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and ultimately the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers. The future of the automotive industry looked bleak and the part supplier industry had, had supplies which were beginning to fail. President Bush recognized the potential calamity and directed the U.S. Treasury to enter into a financing agreement with General Motors uh, that resulted in the secured loan agreement to avoid the consequences to the American automotive industry and the loss of hundreds of thousands of jobs then at stake. Unfortunately, in 2009, conditions continued to erode. The Obama administration inherited the administration of the, of the secured loan agreement and GM needed additional financing. The auto team was appointed uh, and uh, got involved in the negotiations as to additional financing. Central to those negotiations was the protection of taxpayer monies and, therefore, the requirement that GM submit a feasible business plan that provided the prospect of restored viability and recovery of monies advanced. The auto team conducted intensive due diligence uh, in discharging its functions. The important point is that the auto team and the government at all times acted in the same manner as a private secured lender attempting to protect its loan, but also complicated by the desire to retain an American automotive industry. In that context and in the face of the deepening global economic crisis, it became obvious that without radical surgery, restructuring its finances and operations, GM 
would fail, and that would cause a chain reaction throughout the automotive industry. That led to the exploration of alternative issues and possible solutions. That led to the direction of conducting a Section 363 sale under the Bankruptcy Code, a process which was not, at least at that point, totally novel and had been used in many other similar situations. As it became evident that there was no access to credit for General Motors uh, and the uh, large amount of debt outstanding to the United States, the only source of financing and investment was the U.S. Treasury and the export development of Canada. Integral to the process, as amply described in my written testimony, was that the end result would be an operating efficient company capable to compete in its own marketplaces with, prospect, with a prospect of returning to the purchaser all or a good portion of its loans and investments. Incidentally, that is the same objective that ultimately was the objectives of the Unsecured Creditors Committee that was appointed in the Chapter 11 cases to recover, to recover some return on the claims of unsecured creditors, which I might say included uh, salaried employees of both GM and ultimately through Delphi's own Chapter 11 case. This is the normal process in Chapter 11 cases in pro involving Section 363 sales, private lenders and investors, and a process that was used basically in the Bethlehem Steel case. In Section 363 situations, the purchaser is an active participant in the structuring of the sale and often selects the assets which are to be purchased and the executory contracts which should be assumed and leases and along those uh, avenues. Uh, in connection with a 363 sale that anticipates a operating, an ongoing operations, labor unions have a level of, of leverage that other participants don't have. A sale is not going to be successful if you cannot operate the plants. And to operate the plants, you have to have workers and labor peace. And that was what, one of the main objectives in connection with the section, section 363 sale and the restructuring of General Motors. As I set forth in the written testimony, the relationship with Delphi Corporation was very complex. Uh, Delphi was a major supplier to GM, and without those supplies, it would have been impossible for GM to continue to operate its plants. Sixty percent of steering parts came from Delphi. Uh, the, the, two, the two Chapter 11 cases, in some respects, were joined at the hip. It turned out to be a very successful operation. GM is successful. Delphi is successful. And I think the government and the GM management did a great job in coming up with a feasible plan. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, and I thank uh, all of our witnesses uh, for their testimony. And uh, we'll turn to questions now. First, I want to uh, talk to the uh, Special Inspector General, uh, Ms. Romero. Uh, I just about fell out of my chair when you uh, cited the number of uh, convictions and also the char people charged with stealing from TARP. Could you repeat that again for the record? Absolutely. I really appreciate you uh, raising this. So SIGTARP is a law enforcement agency, so we conduct criminal investigations. As a result of our investigation so far, 151 people have been charged with crimes, and 111 of them have been convicted so far. The others are waiting trial or 111 plate. convicted. Good. Yep. 58 of those. Let me just tell you, prison. good work. I don't think any of the American people, I mean, TARP is always touted as such a success and everything, but it looks like when you open the uh, cupboard, the rats find their way to the cheese and steal a lot of it. Um, when we talk about this whole uh, topping up of uh, pensions, um, this, isn't, this wasn't a normal bankruptcy. It would have been handled quite differently, wouldn't it? Uh, uh, Ms. Boberg, if, it, if this was a, a regular bankruptcy? Normally, in bankruptcy, when plans are being terminated, and just to be clear, usually PBGC is terminating plans because there is no viable sponsor mm -hmm. and they are underfunded. But the whole bankruptcy was, it, it wasn't handled like a normal bankruptcy, right? From a PBGC What's the perspective. What was the difference in this uh, and how this was handled? What made these terminations unique was the presence of GM. Yeah. But again, the whole difference in what was done here is the topping up and, again, um, what took place was that they were using what? 
That's the question. Can you answer that? Anyone knows? Taxpayer money? Is that the truth? It's a little unclear because it's all fungible. I mean, we were not, we were not looking to track that. I know, but what, where the hell did the money come from? Excuse the expression. It came from the taxpayers. Uh, even Mr. Miller, the minority witness, just said that it was, uh, it was uh, taxpayer money. Uh, and most of it is deficit money, 40 cents on a dollar. But that is the difference. I have been in business and you file bankruptcy and you go through a court proceedings and there may be some protection of pensions uh, uh, through pension guarantee fund if you are a participant, et cetera. But the difference here is that uh, taxpayer money was making up the difference. Now, some of you all participated in it was the presidential the president's automotive task force, auto task force. Raise your hand if you participated. Okay, three here. Okay, do you all participate in the Poughkeepsie meeting? Did you participate in Poughkeepsie meeting, uh, Feldman? No, not familiar. You weren't there. Were you there, Ratner? Were uh, you there, familiar. Wilson? You mean the Poughkeepsie Delphi mediation? Yeah. Sure. Yes, but the other two were not. So you're the only one at the table that was there. Right? I think that is correct. Okay. And I understand there were union representatives at that meeting, and that was the basis of a lot of the discussion that was taken prior to making a final decision as to, uh, as to how this was going to all play out. But uh, there was no one, rep not, uh, no one from the non-salaried uh, uh, side of the equation, was there? Sir, I don't, I don't recall that. The primary participants were um, representatives of of GM and Delphi. But was there a union advisor. representative? I was told there was a union representative. Does yeah, anyone know? There were dozens of people. Do you know, um, sure. Ms. Romero, if there were, were? There were dozens of union representatives? No, there were dozens of people. I can't people. tell you okay. for sure who was. Well, I am told there was no one representing the non-salaried, where a lot of the decisions were made, which seems a little bit uh, unfair. And again, so I can think I ask the, you who, who you think was representing the unions? Because I don't recall anyone there who did. Uh, I was told that there was representation. And was again, it by a source that was no, there? By, as my staff, and they are usually fairly reliable. Today is only Wednesday. <laughs> okay. Um, That's a public conference. Mr. Ratner, too, you, uh, you talked about this being a success, and uh, GM and Chrysler wouldn't make, wouldn't make it without it. But, uh, Others made it without it, Ford and a whole host of others. Uh, isn't that correct, too? Uh, that's correct. Yeah. And they made good decisions. I mean, I was in business. I would have loved to have somebody fund me when I had losses or wasn't making money or was on the verge of bankruptcy. But here, again, I think the principal difference is that we used taxpayer money for the bailout. Does anyone have any idea, uh, Bo, uh, Ms. Boberg, of how much money uh, was used for, uh, I heard there was uh, some resolution of liability for uh, health care. Uh, we, we did not look at the VEBA, is I think what you are asking about, mm. the retiree health. Yeah. Um, I know that there had been some provision perhaps in but the But I was told that that, 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 was, that that was also part, part of the bailout. It, we did not look at that. You don't know. Do you know, Ms. Romero? I don't know the exact but, amount, uh, but, I was but it was part of the bailout. Figure out how much the pension top-up cost and uh, health care, any, of the, any uh, of, of the money that probably will not be paid back to the taxpayers. It won't be paid back as opposed to some of the other money. Is that correct? The estimated amount, the, this is what GM and Treasury were working with at the time for the top-up of the union employees, this would be all the unions, would, was $1 to $1.5 billion. And that won't be paid back. There's no mechanism for that. No, it's not a. It's not separate than the the TARP funds that have to be paid back anyway, where Treasury expects a loss. Uh -huh. All right. Um, and again, uh, we only have one person that was at the Poughkeepsie meeting, so we'll, we'll try to find out exactly who who was there. Ha, uh, my last question is. Um, I have only chaired this with and Mr. Connolly as my ranking member since the beginning of the year. However, the inquiry into this matter has gone on for at least two years previous. You have been involved for how long, Mr. Romero? Three years. 
And would, how would you describe the folks from uh, TARP and Treasury, all the, the government folks that were involved, Pension Guarantee, as, co as uh, their cooperation as your investigation has gone forward? Well, this, um, this audit was very much delayed by the refusal of four auto team members uh -huh. to uh, It'd be interviewed yeah. by us. Well, I made one pledge when I became chairman to Mr. Turner that all hell would break loose if we, didn't, if we did not get a response. I, I did think at the beginning that they finally had become responsive. But I will not tolerate, uh, as chair of a, a subcommittee or participating in this committee, with nonresponsiveness from any of the agencies. And there will be, uh, and I think Mr. Conley shares this, too. We expect and demand uh, the information. I know that has been turned over. It has been late. And I know that they did everything to delay uh, to uh, keep information from, uh, from you. And I think that is a sad commentary, because uh, the, the story does need to be told. And I think that it is our uh, uh, responsibility to look into how this unfolded and how taxpayer money was used and if people were treated fairly with taxpayer money. So, again, I thank you for your perseverance and the good job you did. And I wish you good luck on the conviction of the balance of those uh, folks that uh, stole out of the cookie jar. Common? Thank you. We will get them. All right. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Connolly, <laughs> go get them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> by the way, just to clear up something, Mr. Wilson, you are under oath. Your testimony is you do not recall any union reps at that Poughkeepsie meeting. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. Thank I, you. I don't recall that. Just want to make get in the record, um, since you were the only one at the table who was there. Uh, Ms. Boberg, uh, you, I, I think I heard you uh, characterize the bankruptcy as unusual. Is that correct? From the perspective of planned termination in the PBGC, it was unusual. PBG, PBGC's role in it was as it has been with other terminations. We were asked to look at, at, at the perspective of PBGC, and we looked at the 10 largest terminations. And you know, everyone, of course, has its different twists and turns, but they were all pretty much the same. PBGC is mainly governed by ERISA, so most of what they do is in statute. Mm -hmm. What was different here with the top-ups? And the, and the presence of GM, if, if Delphi had emerged in bankruptcy and tried to top up the plans, PBGC would have given the plans back. Gotcha. Because okay, if they could do that, right. any employer could do if that. If I may, because I want to explore the narrative here that some are trying to establish. Um, let's go back. The top off GM negotiated at the time of the spinoff of Delphi was with the unions. Is that correct? Yes. At the time, the union workers being represented, their pensions weren't fully funded. Is that correct? Correct. The salaried workers who now are complaining about the fact that they didn't get topped off, unlike the union workers, in fact, they were fully funded at the time of the spinoff. Is that correct? Yes, their oh. plan was overfunded. Subsequently, something happened. So they, okay, so they were fully funded. The union folks weren't. The union folks negotiated a contract to try to correct that and get a top off. Salary workers didn't. No taxpayer dollars yet. And of course, no one thinks Delphi goes under, but it does. And I'm sorry. Conley, if I could, if I could interrupt for just a moment, and I'll give you additional time. Um, as you're having this discussion. Um, that is not necessarily the, a, a complete characterization of, of what the issue is. As Ms. Boberg knows, the issue also is on the termination and on the funding itself right. and on the dispute of the assets. So certainly on the top up. And I just want to make certain that, that her answers are understood to be limited to just this yes, issue yes. of the top up. Thank there, you. there are multiple other issues leading up to termination yep. that are, are at risk. I thank the Chair. Yeah, I, I'm just trying to key off on the narrative here to make sure I understand what happened and when, but you're right. obviously there are other issues that we have to, uh, you're quite correct in, in, in addressing. So, so subsequently, subsequent to the spinoff, things went south. Yes. And the salaried workers who had not negotiated a top-off 
so there was no contractual obligation to give them one, sued to try to get one. Is that correct? Yes. And what happened to that lawsuit? They are still in court. I am sorry? They are still in court. Are you sure about that? Yes. They are still in court? So it is still pending? Yes. Okay. Um, so they can, they can pursue the, the route of litigation. Um, but if, if you are suing GM to get a top off uh, from a new, uh, I mean, from a court point of view, if you're in bankruptcy, why would a court? I'm just, I'm talking about, you know, in theory. Why would a court approve a new obligation? Would, would, would you mind if I, I hop in for one again? I'll give yeah, additional yeah. time. I just want to take time out of my time to clear that up. Uh, that's not necessarily the case. I mean, the issue um, is, is not a suit for for top up. Uh, the, the issue is one of valuing of assets, termination of the pension plan to begin with. Uh, the issue of going south, that actually is in dispute as to whether or not there were sufficient assets within the plan prior to termination and whether or not these gentlemen exerted influence on the termination. And, and so it is not really just an issue of, of we are going to court to, to get a top-up. The, top, the process of the top-ups was really the discussion of determining post-Treasury's denial that they were not involved, were they, weren't, were they involved, and here from the report we have, they were. Um, I want to be clear, Ms. Boberg, there were multiple lawsuits, and the one against GM was thrown out. It is not pending. Is that correct? That is correct. All right. Just because it is a little misleading to say it is still pending. The GM suit is not. And, and that is what I am getting at. Is there, was there an, any kind of implied commitment? Certainly there was no contractual commitment. But was there some implied commitment to keep these folks whole by GM? nine years after the separation from Delphi. I am sorry. I, what, I, I didn't understand your question completely. Can you, that there was an implied commitment? Well, there, in some of the conversation, there seems to be some, the, some idea that either GM or the taxpayers have an obligation to folks who found themselves not whole in their pensions. But that population is a population that was not covered under the contractual agreement with the unions. It is nine years later. GM is in bankruptcy. They pursued you know, their legal route against GM, and that was thrown out. And, and what I was going to get at is what, what uh, court in the land, bankruptcy court, would look at this situation and say, even though this is you know, one of the largest bankruptcies ever, it is the largest automotive manufacturer in the world, uh, 900,000 jobs are at stake, and we are looking at, can, is there a plan we can salvage the company with or do we liquidate? Uh, thank God we didn't go the route of liquidation, but it was an option. While we are doing all that, let us take on a new obligation, that is to say one you are not contractually obligated to right now, it, it, topping off or making whole these, this category of pensioners. But Mr. Collins, and you know, I can't really speak to the intent of the bankruptcy court. And if I could hop in for just one yeah. minute again, because I, I know, and you've been you know, in, incredibly kind and, and diligent, I know, in the manner in looking at this. Th this is one where there are, unfortunately, members who have been working on it for four years. So it's the distinctions I know that you are struggling with, perhaps we can help with. The issue of contractual obligations, there are no contractual obligations post-bankruptcy. Um, there was a labor agreement, and of course, salaried retirees, salaried employees don't have a, a labor agreement, so they have no contractual obligation. Um, so it is the distinction in how they sit as to where or not there was a, a prior agreement. But entering into bankruptcy, they all sit equally because bankruptcy voids all of the agreements. They have to be, be redone. It's, they have to be renegotiated. Uh, so it is it's, it's not, it's not fair to say they didn't have one and they did. It is it's how are they treated as they go through the bankruptcy process. And, then, and that is in her report for the GAO. Yeah. Uh, well, whether it is fair or not is a different issue. That is a subjective judgment. But your distinction is fair. It, there is a distinction. But, but I do note, for the record, one had a contractual a contract, one did not. Um, one was whole at the time of separation, one was not. Uh, and uh, there is no evidence, but correct me if I am wrong, that somebody from Treasury or the administration politically decided help this group, not that group? Or is there, Ms. Boebert? We reviewed public documents. We, we, in fact, separated a bit. And I guess I would ask Nikki to talk yeah, about I, the methodology. Fair enough. I will turn to Ms. Romero. I am just asking whether you, GAO, encountered, encountered anything. Ms. Romero. 
I'm a little bit lost. What was the question? Well, I, I'm trying to lead us up through this narrative with the help of my good friend. Sure. Excuse me, Mr. His Conley. question was with respect to the top up. Is there evidence that you uncovered that, that established that it was solely politically motivated? Well, or at like, all politically motivated? Well, just like in all of our audits, we look at everything. So what we were interested in is what were all the reasons, all the factors and considerations that went into the decision that GM and Treasury made on the top up. So we didn't exclude one factor or, or uh, focus on one factor, and we did not find evidence um, that the political clout of the UAW uh, was a factor in GM and Treasury's decision. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, um, uh, I think fairly my time is probably up, uh, and I thank you for your guidance. Thank the gentleman and uh, recognize now uh, Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, First off, thank all of you for your participation in this, because what we are doing is recreating what occurred so we can find out whether or not what occurred was proper and how to address it. Uh, Ms. Romero, there were a number of people who threw political accusations uh, when this first started, um, and I wanted to ask you a question that I think should help us in, in dissolving the political tension, and that is, uh, you are not a, a President Obama appointee, are you not? I am. Thank you. Um, According to the SEC website, November 18, 2012, the Securities and Exchange Commission charged you, charged former Quadrangle Group Principal Stephen Ratner, yourself, with participating in a widespread kickback scheme to obtain investments from New York's largest pension fund. I am going to ask uh, um, consent that the portions of the SEC website concerning those charges be entered into the record and the full text of the complaint on the kickback scheme in the pension fund. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Ratner, did you pay a settlement in that matter? Yes. What was, it, what was the amount of that settlement? Uh, it was about a little over $6 million. I think it is, according to their website, $6.2 million that you paid to settle that claim of a kickback scheme with respect to a pension fund. Mr. Ratner, you indicated that the decisions that um, were applied with respect to the pensions were those of commercially reasonable. Could you define commercially reasonable for me? Commercially reasonable in, uh, in our minds would be decisions that, you would, that a, a private actor would make in order to ensure in this particular case that money that was being invested was being invested wisely. When you considered that private actor, would you consider a private actor that was involved in a kickback scheme for pension funds or those that had not been? You don't have to answer that, Mr. Ratner. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Bovberg, um, you were in Dayton and you did an excellent job describing the GAO report. And I greatly appreciate your distinction of that your report is not, uh, as Ms. Romero's is, a detailed analysis of uh, documents and records requested from the government and, and the Treasury Department and reviewed. Um, you um, did in your report uh, specifically dedicate a section to, um, I believe it is on page 9, the issue of Treasury's multiple roles. When I did my opening, I indicated that part of the concern in all this is that Treasury through TARP became multiple people. I mean, that Treasury is on the board of the PBGC. Treasury became new GM. Treasury became the bondholders and, 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 and the, you know, um, some of the uh, um, equity holders. Um, and um, you indicated this. You said, in previous reports, we also have examined the challenges posed to Treasury due to its multiple roles as a private pension regulator and a GM shareholder, as well as having its secretary serve on the PBGC board. Now. You testified earlier, which is why I want to clarify this. You said, well, PBGC viewed this normally. Now, you have not reviewed all the emails that we have and that Mrs. Romero has, so the word normally I am a little concerned about. So let's just go back to what I recall you having said in Dayton and end it with this. In Dayton, you said those Treasury's multiple roles did have the appearance of a conflict of interest from which you were concerned and noted in your report. Is that still accurate today? 
Yes, and I'd like to ask Ms. Clowers to jump in because she leads our auto work at GAO and was probably in her report was the first okay. place. We we'll, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute because I only have five minutes and I have to get back to Ms. Romero, but we'll take your answer for the record. Ms. Romero, in the GAO report, they state this sentence well, in their testimony today. They say, as we reported in 2011, Treasury officials said, which is why the distinction of GAO looked at public documents, that while Treasury did not explicitly approve or disapprove of GM's agreeing to honor previously negotiated top-up agreements with some unions, it agreed that GM had solid commercial reasons, which is that dis distinction that Mr. Ratner tried to explain to us of what the definition of commercially reasonable is. In your written testimony today, I believe on page 44, um, you state uh, that the auto team made it clear, uh, no, that was another provision. Um, that they specifically did approve them and played a role. And could you talk about those two roles? In your report, you talk about the, the two things. One, that as the um, purchaser, they had a construct in the agreement that required that issues that were over $100 million and that related to pensions must be approved by them. And secondly, from the um, dialogue that you reviewed, that you understand that they were involved. So could you explain those two issues to me as to how that statement that J.O. looked in the public records is, is not accurate? So. Um, yeah, let me talk about what, what we found. This is what I, what I opened with in my opening statement. There was no way for Treasury's role to be advisory. The TARP loan agreement from 2008 sets up basically two roles for Treasury. For the big things, like things over $100 million or big decisions like the collective bargaining agreement, Treasury has the approval rights. They are the decider. There are other things where Treasury would just give advice to GM. The top-up only appears in the collective bargaining agreement. It is not some separate agreement. And the discussion of the top-up has been confusing so far because it has been as if the top-up was somehow a separate agreement that was separately negotiated uh, and, and Jim made a decision on it and came to the auto team and said, we would like to do this. None of those facts are what we found to have actually happened. It appears in the collective bargaining agreement. The other part of this, not just, the collective, uh, not just uh, Treasury's rights to approve the collective bargaining agreement, Treasury became the purchaser in bankruptcy, and that changed everything as well. Mr. Miller, in his written testimony, and he was GM's bankruptcy lawyer, says that the U.S. Treasury acted in the same manner as other secured creditors would act in selecting the assets it would purchase, it would purchase and liabilities it would assume. And that is what Mr. Wilson told us, and that is what GM officials told us, that GM officials told us we weren't in control. We could make recommendations, but it is ultimately up to the purchaser. An obligation that would be assumed would be the collective bargaining agreement and all of the obligations that were in it. Therefore, it was Treasury's role direct role to make that decision as the purchaser, just like they did with any other obligation that the purchaser took on. Thank you for the additional time. I see my time has expired. I look forward to the second round. Recognize now Mr. Ryan. Mr. Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, and I appreciate everyone's uh, participation here. Um, this is obviously, uh, for me, representing Ohio, uh, Northeast Ohio, this is a, a bittersweet moment, which is why I'm, I'm thankful to be able to sit here and be able to be on this committee, of which I don't normally sit, because Ohio has benefited greatly from what has happened in the auto industry in the past couple of years. One in every eight jobs in Ohio is related to the auto industry, um, and that makes its way down through the supply chain, as you well know. On the other end of this is a group of people who live in my congressional district, primarily in Mr. Turner's as well, and some in Columbus that are Delphi salaried, uh, who have been devastated, families devastated. And I think Mr. Feldman mentioned you go through this a lot. We go through it a lot, too, for those of us who represent older industrial areas. And I hope as we talk about bankruptcy, this is one or two bankruptcies that we are talking about. And I hope uh, I get as much enthusiasm from my friends on the other side about reforming bankruptcy laws for all Americans. Because for me and my congressional district, this has been going on for a long, long time. That is not what this hearing is about. But these are people who have been not made whole and who have been harmed, and we are here to try to figure out how to help those people. But there is a broader issue that I will set on the side about bankruptcy laws. And I will be looking forward to support from the other side of the aisle to reform those laws, like the Delphi salary folks who sat in my office the other day said they would be willing to help us um, make those changes. To sit in a meeting with these folks who 
didn't do anything wrong, uh, paid money in, had a pension, were ready to go, worked hard their whole lives, uh, and sit here and hear the stories, as I heard the other day. I walk into a room, you know, two or three of the eight people sitting there I call coach because they were a former coach or a coach in our community. These aren't people who make you know, a kajillion dollars just because they happen to be white collar. These are hardworking people uh, who, in my estimation, uh, got a raw deal and were trying to, to figure out how to make this whole. I, I want to make one other point as well. Um, there's a lot of splinter unions that were involved here. We talk a lot about Delphi salaried, um, but there is a list of splinter unions, uh, the machinists, electrical workers, Michigan Regional Council of Carpenters, Local 687 and Interior Systems, International Brotherhoods of Painters and Allied Trade, uh, Sign and Display Union, Teamsters, Boilermakers, Operating Engineers, Catering, Restaurant, Bar and Hotel Workers. Lots of other splinter unions are in the same position. So I don't want us to forget anybody as we go um, through this process. I also would like to say um, that the people responsible for the bankruptcy of a company like Delphi that is having a ripple effect throughout our community uh, are the ones losing their pension over this whole thing. And clearly something is terribly wrong uh, with the bankruptcy system. But let me just say, um, these guys can't go back, these men and women can't go back 25 years and say, okay, this is what our portfolio is going to look like because of this bankruptcy. They can't go back and do that. And I want to say very clearly that I do not believe that Congress or the retirees still have a complete picture uh, of what happened in this situation. And if it is determined uh, by, through the evidence produced here or in the court or in the lawsuit that Delphi salaried retirees and the splinter unions were unjustly harmed due to politics or favoritism, that they must be made whole. And I will continue um, to pursue that. So let me get to um, some questions uh, here. Um, first uh, question is going to go to uh, Ms. Bobberg, who uh, testified uh, a little bit about the uh, GAO report in 2011. Do you feel that the PBGC was forthcoming uh, with the documents for the GAO report in 2011? I did. We had no reason to believe they were not. So recently the court has ordered PBGC to turn over additional documents uh, as well and communications. And is it of your opinion that those new documents or that new communication uh, would somehow influence the 2011 report? No, because when, when we approached that report, we were very clear that um, there were a number of questions that the requesters asked, and we took the ones that we could deal with in public documents. And, you know, we might um, talk to PBGC people or Treasury people for clarification of a public document. Uh, we did not interview the auto team. We did not look at emails. That was a question that was about whether Treasury had uh, exerted political pressure in this process, and GAO did not feel that we could do that work, that that was more appropriate for an IG office, mm -hmm. hence the, the split between our methodologies. Um, if I could take up an, an extra minute here, Mr. Chairman. Um, one of the things I want to uh, ask you is about the, the range of recovery ratios um, with regard to the terminated plans. And did you feel that the PBGC in any way left monies on the table? Uh, with, the, with those plans that maybe could have bumped the value of the plan assets? There is some discrepancy between the Delphi salary folks. Maybe, Nicole, you would like to uh, touch upon this as well, whoever can answer it best. Um, there is some discrepancy where our folks, uh, salaried folks, are saying, well, we think we could have gotten a lot more revenue for the plan. Um, do you believe in, in your uh, participation in this case that there were monies left on, possibly left on the table? We did not see that. We saw that out of $7 billion owed uh, on these plans, PBGC got $700 million in recoveries. Um, that is not really outside the range of what they have gotten in uh, the 10 largest terminations. Uh, they did better with airlines. They got up to 38 percent, but on some they got nothing. They, they try to do what they can. So we did not, we didn't evaluate a particular, uh, you know, foreign lien or something like that, but we did look at the process and whether they followed it. And what we saw was that they followed the process as they have with other terminations. And, and most of it is, uh, is 
uh, required by ERISA, by the pension law. Mm -hmm. I, I know I'm, I'm way, way over my time, so I yield back, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, could I have just a Yes, in fact, uh, I'll, I'll Mr. Bo time for Ms. Boberg, and I'm just going to take this and pass it back, because I think what Mr. Ryan is asking is, is incredibly important. Um, I think the reason why several people are struggling with your answers to today as opposed to the answers that you gave in Dayton is that they're, you're not giving answers that are in the context of what you did. I mean, you're, you looked at public documents, and you were not given the issue of um, of uh, you know, the influence and how it occurred. But, but yet your statements today appear to be a little stronger, and I, I, I just want to assist you in, in the, the confines of, of what I know your report says. Um, you did not find that PBGC did everything according to their rules and regulations. You, you don't. You had no information of that. You had no emails. You had public documents. You did not interview those who were involved in the GM bankruptcy. So to state that conclusion, which actually is the subject matter of ongoing litigation, is far more expansive than I think you in, intend, and I think that is how the panel is hearing it. So I want to give you a chance to, to confine your answer back to, I did not find anything that would indicate those in the things that we, in the documents that we reviewed. It is not that you can conclusively say that everything was honky-dory, correct? We did not do a compliance review. You Thank are you. correct. What we did look at was how might this termination have been different from others. And, and you found nothing that told you difference in the public domain, but you had no access to the others. And that is why you were helpful to us, but you can't give a conclusion beyond that. And I think that is what we have kind of struggled with. And today. we can't talk about motivations right. of people. Right. That, that's what so we I, I, I appreciated your work. I appreciate your, your dedication to it, your statements. I just want to make clear its limitations for today, for today's purposes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Turner, if you want to take a, an additional three minutes, uh, uh, you, can, you can just continue, and then I'll take, Thank you. Uh, I'll yield to Mr. Back to this side, okay. and then myself. So. Mr. Feldman, take it um, I believe, and let's hold for, for I believe that you know, you're under oath, and we have met before in this format, and um, I struggle on the issue of the auto task force involvement. As you know, GAO does a report that says, Treasury says that they weren't involved in the top-up. Ms. Romero's report says conclusively that obviously Treasury was involved and extensively because of, one, by the terms of TARP you were required to be at Treasury, and two, you actually were because she looked at the documents and the, and the like. I have previously asked you, and, and I am not uh, saying that you have misrepresented anything to us, but I have previously asked you and struggled with, with an understanding of your role in the discussion on termination of pension plans. Because I, I believe that, that um, it has been unclear uh, to people trying to determine what occurred uh, that you were involved in discussions with respect to the termination or non-termination of pension plans of old GM as they went through the bankruptcy process. Now, you don't deny that, right? You don't deny that you were involved in discussions with respect to the termination or non-termination of pension plans from old GM as they went through the bankruptcy process. Is that correct? Congressman, just to be clear, of, of old GM? Old well, or GM that is going through the bankruptcy, of the existing plans as it went, as it went to with respect to going forward in the bankruptcy and new GM. In, in contrast Let me shorten it. Sure. Were you involved in discussions with respect to termination or non-termination of pension plans in the GM bankruptcy? Of General Motors as opposed to Delphi. That was the distinction I was asking you. Uh, I see. Um, give me the distinction if, you, if there is one, then. Sure. I, I don't recall being involved in discussions of termination of pension plans of, of General Motors. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't recall being part of those discussions to the extent that there were discussions about that. With respect to Delphi, uh, certainly, I spoke with Joe House from the PBGC, who communicated to me what the PBGC's thinking was with respect to the Delphi pension plans, both on the hourly side and the salary side. Okay, let's stop there. Um, and yeah, I said mine was broad pension plans because I wanted you to to give me the the, the uh, to walk me here. So, in that speaking with Joe House of PBGC with respect to termination or non-termination, did you ever? advocate or have a position? 
Not that I recall, no. Okay. Well, I'm going to hand you your June 18th email to Joe House, and maybe it will help you recall. I'll give you a moment to read it. Because the question I ask you is specifically structured with respect to your own email. Let me re-ask you the question. <clears throat> Mr. Feldman, did you advocate with respect to the issue of termination or non-termination with respect to issues relating to Delphi pension plans? I recognize what the email says. I, I still would okay, disagree pause. with the word if you're, if, you're, if you're not going to answer yes, I will just read it for the record. This is Matt Feldman on June 18th in response to Joe House. He says, thanks. <clears throat> I'll call you later today or tomorrow. When are this to the record? We are having a sit-down on the D hourly plan in the AM. There is a split as to what should happen. There are some wanting to see it terminate. I have, that is you, been advocating, the next word is hard, I have been advocating hard for our deal, emphasis on our deal, because that would include you, and I believe that will be the conclusion, meaning I have been advocating hard for our deal and I believe that I am going to win, I believe that will be the conclusion, but wanted to give you a heads up. Mr. Feldman, you didn't say you didn't do this, you said you didn't recall it. The email speaks for itself. I am going to ask you the question again. Did you advocate with respect to the termination or non-termination of a Delphi pension plan? As part with of a PBGC. broader understanding with the PBGC, obviously I did. That is what the email says. But it is very narrow and, frankly, misleading to just say, did you advocate for a position on the pension plan, which is I, I terminate. I, I said like terminate. That is your like word. Into a broader Mr. Feldman, I am only using your word, which is terminate. I am putting nothing else behind that. So for the record, your answer is yes, this is your email, and yes, you did advocate, as this says, hard, with respect to the issue of termination or non-termination. I am going to turn to Ms. I will yield my Thank time you. and come back to Ms. Ramirez. Uh, and to be fair, uh, I yielded you the balance of the time, so you had the full five minutes. And then I had given Mr. Conley some extra time, so the other side has about uh, 30, 45 seconds extra coming. Mr. Let me uh, yield to the ranking member who has arrived. So you have uh, six minutes, uh, Mr. Rank. Can you hold on for a second? I've been watching just real quick. Just I've been watching this clock. Can you explain that timing again to me? Because I've seen. Well, I, I count about. Almost ten minutes just since I've been sitting here, but and I came in when he, you gave him three minutes. I gave him uh, my an additional three minutes. Oh, I see. Uh, I gave him my time. Okay, okay. Uh, we're in the second round, and I oh. gave him my. I time. see. Okay, all right. And then he took some of it, and I said, "Well, go ahead and take the balance of your time." Okay, I got and you. Then he went over. Uh, I, I keep this pretty good a lot, uh, Mr. Now, I just want to make sure that I, I just. And so right now you have six minutes, thank and, you. and I and you know if you want ten, very well. Uh, then I'll give him more yeah. time. Very well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I know you to be a fair man. That's why I've always admired you, and I really mean that. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Romero, I want to thank you for your thorough audit. Uh, I, for one, I, I do sympathize with the Delphi salaried uh, workers. Uh, whose pensions will not be what they thought and planned on. That is a very sad situation, very unfortunate situation. I was surprised to learn from your report that the Delphi salaried workers' pensions had been fully funded at the time Delphi spun off from GM in 1999. Is that right? Is that correct? Yes. Um, those pensions were fully funded when Delphi started as an independent company. Is that right? Yes. All right. Now, Mr. Boberg and Ms. Clowers, it is my understanding that the salaried pensions um, actually overfunded 
at the time of the spinoff, they were overfunded at the time of the spinoff. Do you know the exact figure? It was close to 120 percent. So they were overfunded. Hello. Are you talking to, are yes. you saying something? Okay. Yes, right. overfunded. So something happened between 1999 and 2009 that caused the fully funded pensions of Delphi salary workers to become underfunded by 2009. Uh, Ms. Romero, what happened and who is responsible? Who is responsible for the plan being, uh, yeah, I, being I just, funded, fully funded? That would be Delphi. Yeah, and so it was Delphi management who did not continue to make pension payments, and their failure to make payments resulted in Delphi salaried workers with underfunded pensions. Is that a fair statement? That is correct. All right. Now, Ms. Romero, your, your audit probed the decision about what to do about those underfunded pensions. The question came up in the context of GM's bankruptcy in 2009, during which the United States Government provided a loan and then a debtor in possession financing to enable GM to survive as a domestic automaker. Is that correct? That is correct. Now, the SIGTARP report identifies the reasons GM officials did not want to top up the pensions of the Delphi salaried employees in 2009. Let me read from your re report, Ms. Romero. It says, GM's CEO told SIGTARP that Mr. Boyce, that is GM's treasurer, had explained that if GM found a way to fund the top up during GM's bankruptcy, it would be as if GM had funded the plan twice. As CEO Henderson explained, GM had already fully funded Delphi's salary pensions at the time of Delphi's spinoff, and there was no basis to do so again. End of quote. That is a part of your report, is that right? That is correct. That is what GM's CEO told us. Well, do you stand by that finding? Well, it is not a finding. It is just what a witness told us in our audit. Okay. So, GM, so according to this, GM had commercial business reasons not to top up the Delphi salary pension. Well, let me go back. Do you, did, you have, did you find anything that contradicted the statement that I just read? No, I did not find anything that contradicted it. There is a bigger context, which is included in the report. All right. So GM had commercial business reasons not to top up the Delphi salary pensions in 2009. Those were not the Treasury Department's reasons. Those were not the Obama administration's reasons. Those were GM's reasons. Is that right? Well, this is where I need to add a little context. So right. the, the earlier page of my report, right before this statement, talks about how GM had taken the position uh, that it was prohibited under the TARP loan agreement from increasing the, the giving the top up to the salaried workers uh, without Treasury's consent. So GM alone took the position that they alone could not do the top up. And GM CEO uh, Mr. Henderson at the time told us that Treasury's consent would have been necessary, that Treasury ultimately had to agree under the TARP loan agreement. So what happened was that Mr. Henderson, went to Mr. Ratner. Uh, and according to both of them, according to Mr. Ratner, uh, he says that GM came to them because, um, this is a quote, GM wanted to do something for the salaried retirees. Mr. Ratner discussed it with the CEO, and although he didn't uh, remember the specifics of the conversation, he told SIGTARP there was nothing defensible from a commercial standpoint. He says, this is from Mr. Ratner, quote, we didn't think there was anything defensible. We felt bad, but we didn't think it was justifiable. What happened then is Mr. Ratner sends an email to the rest of the auto team saying that he had spoken to Mr. Henderson, and he wrote in his email, with respect to the Delphi retirees, Walter Borst, who is the Treasury, is apparently preparing some kind of proposal 
for how to do something for them that is defensible. And then now, let says, me, let me, well, let me ask you this. Right. Now, the quote I gave you a little bit earlier, Boyce had said that it would be like funding it twice. Is that right? Right. So I am putting in context. So Mr. Henderson talks to Mr. Ratner, goes to him and says, we would like to do something for the salaried retirees. Mr. Ratner says something to Mr. Henderson. Uh, we don't know the exact specifics, but says basically we don't think there is anything commercially defensible. Then Mr. Borst, who is the Treasurer for GM, goes to look to see if there is something defensible. He is trying to see if there is something defensible. And he and Mr. Henderson, uh, because that is the standard that Treasury, through their auto team, had given them. It is not necessarily GM's standard. The commercially reasonable standard is the, is the standard that the auto team had given. And remember that GM took the position that, it, that uh, Treasury had to make the decision on the salaries that they did not have authority. So then Mr. Borst goes to try to prepare something that would fit into Treasury's standard, the commercially defensible standard, and comes back and, and he and Mr. Henderson um, can't come up with anything. Explain that, explain that commercially, the, the standard that you just talked about. Explain that to me. Sure. The commercially reasonable standard doesn't exist other than through the auto team and through TARP. It is the marching orders that uh, the auto task force to Mr. Summers and Mr. Geithner give to the auto team as to how they should be making decisions. And so there is no definition of it or standard. It is just interpreted, and it is interpreted by the auto team that that means to act like a private investor is, is essentially how they, how they take it. Um, they tried to do that every time. They, they, what we found in our, in our audit was they made some decisions that were not what a private investor would make. So, for example, deciding not to move the headquarters of GM through Detroit, which would save money. These are other governmental concerns that come into play that a private investor wouldn't have. And so that commercially reasonable standard, commercially defensible, is the auto team standard. It's not necessarily GM's standard. It's the auto team standard. And so that's what they were looking for. Right. Let me just I'm see I'm running out of time. Let me just get to Mr. Miller. GM's Treasurer and CEO made an assessment. GM had already fully funded the salary the retiree pensions 10 years earlier when Delphi was spun off from GM. They got the money, but they had no contractual agreement that obligated GM to further top up those pensions, as I understand it. Mr. Miller, isn't that how you read the report? Is that how you read it? I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Mr. Ratner, Mr. Feldman, and Mr. Wilson, is that finding by the SIGTARP about GM's actions and reasons for not giving Delphi salary and retirees a top-up consistent with your memory? Mr. Ratner first. The reason being that it was not commercially reasonable? Right. Yes, that is my, me my memory. Mr. Feldman? In my memory as well, sir. Mr. Wilson? Yes. I am Mr. Chairman. Okay, um, I calculated I have approximately two minutes left in this round. I have not asked any questions. I gave my five to him. And then um, Mr. Ryan would be next. Uh, do you want to go first, Mr. Ryan, and I will save my two minutes? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Ratner, there were some discussions uh, about terminating the plan. Can you talk to us about how those discussions went. I mean, a lot, a lot of this stuff, there is still a lawsuit and things going on with documents being released. But from your vantage point, can you enlighten us about what those discussions were when it came to we want to terminate the plan? When you say terminate, you are referring to the salary plan? Yes. Uh, the discussions were very much, I think, along the lines of what you have heard the last few minutes, which is that uh, we understood that the failure to provide any financial support to the salaried plan would leave those retirees with reduced benefits. We were not happy about that. We didn't think uh, it was obviously a very good outcome for them. We spent a considerable amount of time thinking about whether there was anything that we could recommend uh, be done for them. And we concluded that it was not commercially reasonable or defensible as a matter of um, normal bankruptcy procedures. There, the, uh, you said to uh, SIGTARP in, the, uh, in the, my reading of it that GM officials had been too generous in the past and the auto team had to dial that back a little bit. Um, that was in the SIGTARP report. Um, and that 
you guys needed to press General Motors to be less generous in relation to the Delphi and the pensions. <laughs> now, to what extent did the auto team press that issue, uh, and did that adversely affect uh, the even the possibility of uh, the top offs? Among the problems at General Motors was that they did not act in a way that one would call commercially reasonable at all times. In fact, they often didn't act in a way that was commercially reasonable, which was a good part of why they were uh, in bankruptcy or insolvent, and a Ford, for example, wasn't. So there were any number of places and times when General Motors um, would recommend or suggest doing something that we did not feel was commercially reasonable, and this was one of them. Mr. Romero, you mentioned that at times the commercially reasonable standard was used, and then at times it hasn't. It was not used. You mentioned one example. Were there other examples where uh, the auto team did not follow that standard? So uh, let me let me be, be very clear here. I, I think what our report talks about, and this is what we found, they tried to use the commercially reasonable standard and act as a private invest investor. But in the end, they were still the government. So there were broader concerns that a private investor would not have. I'll give you a few of them. One, to invest in GM in the first place when no private investor was investing in GM, according to what GM's CFO told us. That, is out, that was done out of concern about saving GM because of the impact a GM failure could have on the broader auto industry. A private investor wouldn't necessarily have those same concerns. Two, deciding not to move uh, GM's headquarters out of Detroit for reasons about how it would impact the city of Detroit. Mr. Ratner talks about this in his book. Those are not considerations that a private investor would normally have. Another one was deciding when they made the additional TARP injection uh, as a loan to fund the bankruptcy, rather than take it as debt, which is what it would be, they were worried about too much debt being GM, GM's, on GM's books. So they decided to convert that to an equity interest, an ownership interest in the new company. That has lower priority in bankruptcy. So that is not something that, that had bigger concerns, broader concerns than a private investor. And uh, finally, on what they decided to pay for GM as the purchaser, there was information in the bankruptcy court, CEO Henderson, GM CEO Henderson talked to us about that, that Treasury ended up paying more than the enterprise value. I believe this is in Mr. Ratner's book, more than GM's enterprise value. These are all these, all of these decisions are just some examples where the auto team had to consider other things other than just dollars and cents um, and, and not act as just a private investor would. And frankly, they shouldn't have. They are the government. And that is one of the lessons learned out of this. Well, I guess as my time is winding down, I am going to argue on behalf of my constituents and, and these Delphi salaried folks that they should have been included in some of these. Uh, if we are not following that standard all the way through, if that is not a hard line standard, and I understand this is a very, very unique situation, that uh, that should be considered. We have $57 million a year getting pulled out of our local economy because of the pensions. And these Delphi salaried were concentrated in areas like mine, like Mr. Turner's and others, that that should have been considered. Uh, as, as the whole bankruptcy proceeding was going on, as the headquarters was, which I think is a good move. But there, sh there were other moves that could have been made, in my opinion, that could have topped these, these folks off. And in my estimation, if you are not going to follow that hard line rule when it comes to commercially reasonable, um, then there are others who uh, lose out because of that. Uh, and that and that's ultimately why we are here. And my time is, is out, and I just would like to make one final pitch to, to my colleagues on the other side, um, that this happens all the time. The distinction here is that the government was involved. But there are bankruptcies every single day in this country, and we need bankruptcy reform, because the, these workers that we are talking about uh, are unique to this particular circumstance, and we are going to advocate as hard as we can for them. But there are thousands and thousands and thousands of other workers across this country who end up on the short end of the stick, who are last in line when it comes to uh, getting made whole, and they get screwed. 
in, in Youngstown, Ohio, and Akron, Ohio, and Cleveland, Ohio, and Pittsburgh, and in, all through the industrial Midwest. We have seen this for 30 years. And so I hope that we get the enthusiasm from the other side when it comes to bankruptcy reform as well. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I am very thankful for this hearing. Mr. Turner, thank you for your, your work and cooperation on this as well. And I hope this uh, leads to some uh, situation where these men and women could be made whole. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I have got about a I have got about a minute and a half, um, uh, and my two minutes is about three and a half minutes, I guess, left from this side, which I will take since I have asked uh, no questions in the second round and yielded my five. Um, first of all, uh, Ms. Romero, in the 99 spinoff, we keep talking about, uh, about topping up employees. Was that just salaried employees or non-salaried employees, one or both? The discussions in, in 1999 were an agreement to top up the, the hourly employees, not the salaried employees. The salaried employees weren't represented at that time, and, and their pension plan was fully funded. Okay. I, I just wasn't clear as to what took place, uh, which was some years previous. And then, um, but the final decision, I mean, when you just cut to the chase, this is there may be problems in bankruptcy, and we may need to do bankruptcy reform. This is not a tip, this was not a typical bankruptcy uh, in a civil proceeding, was it? No, and it, this wasn't even typical for a TARP program. Yeah. This is the only situation in TARP where you have a member of treasury, mm -hmm. members of treasury, treasury officials mm -hmm. being so deeply and significantly involved in the it, it, company. Exactly, and again, you said. Uh, it was ultimately Treasury's decision as the buyer to assume or reject the top-up liability. Treasury, last time I checked, was the United States of America public using public money to, uh, Mr. Uh, I thought Mr. Ryan said, uh, used the term, I try not to use screwed, but because it gets my wife upset. And, uh, but basically, that is what happened. Some people got screwed here uh, who, uh, in this proceeding. And the unfairness is that those people had also paid their taxes, et cetera, into the Treasury of the United States and should have been treated fairly. Now, probably some of this would never have occurred if everyone would have cooperated. But before I became the chair for two years, uh, we couldn't even get the documentation or the cooperation. Uh, Mr. Turner turned to me when I became chair. We did the hearing in June, and I demanded the documentation. And you finished your report, and I think you did an admirable job. You are just reporting uh, the facts. And again, this isn't a, a typical situation. Mr. Ratner had talked about uh, commercially acceptable or reasonable. Uh, process. Uh, I guess they were trying to cover their uh, bases in, in, in all of uh, uh, of this. But uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Wilson, you testified last summer that unions did not receive uh, special treatment. Is that correct? I believe so. Yes, you did. And Ms. Romero. Uh, did you say in your report find that unions receive special treatment in the GM bailout and the bankruptcy proceedings? Well, Treasury gave additional leverage to certain stakeholders, so they, and those were two, the UAW and the bondholders. But they gave, uh, again, some, something special to the union folks, right? They established the hierarchy of who would get a deal cut prior to the bankruptcy, and those were the two groups that, that the auto team uh, picked. Mr. Wilson, uh, any change in light of their findings? No, that is just not correct. The UAW and the bondholders had enormous leverage because they were critical components of a potential restructuring transaction. That is why they had leverage, and that is why they were important to the deal. It wasn't because of anything the Treasury did. I described both my written and verbal testimony. Mm. And, and what were the non-union employees? Chop liver? Unfortunately, um, anyone who didn't have a They were just dumped overboard. No, that's not, that's but, not But again, uh, the union side 
maybe they were entitled to this on the top up, and I have no problem with that. Uh, but what I have a problem with is thousands of people left behind and we are using taxpayer money for the top up. And uh, we also had a testimony today of a billion dollars that won't be returned to the Treasury. So uh, I don't view that as, as fair for, for all. And Mr. Uh, Ryan, Mr. Turner, I have to go back and face these people. I faced some of them at the hearing we held in June. Uh, one, uh, uh, Ms. Brooks isn't here. She told me one person that she ran into this week is basically homeless, who was one of these employees that she talked to this past week. And we will leave the record open. Some of the members weren't able to return after the votes, and she's one of them, to cite in the record what, what this is, uh, how this has affected folks. So, um, again, um, we're, we're, tr we're dealing with uh, Federal taxpayer funds and how they were distributed, and some people were unfairly treated, according uh, to the, the report. And Treasury did have the discretion to make a different decision. Wouldn't that be correct, Ms. Romero? Absolutely, it was their decision. Yes. Okay. Uh, let Chairman, me, Mr. Chairman, if I could just, Mr. I just, uh, I'll go turn. I just to want to make yes, a, go make, right a, ahead. make a point that there there down. were nine eight or nine other union. I just don't want to leave anybody out. So it was the salary, but that list of union members that I gave are also on. Yeah. We can't forget them as we are advocating for this, that there were other seven, eight, nine unions that were also included that had been left out. So I just, we, we talk about the Delphi salary, but it is also these splinter unions as well. And uh, uh, Mr. Ryan, I think every one of them should have been yeah, treated agreed. fairly. Again, it is taxpayer money in this. This isn't I have been involved in business. I have seen bankruptcies and I have seen how they are settled, and there is a lot of unfairness. There are things that we could do to correct that. This was not a uh, civil or commercial bankruptcy uh, in any sense of uh, the, the normal way these things are conducted. Um, again, that is why I am sitting here with you, Mr. That is my beef. And if there were some way in a bipartisan manner to to make people whole. I mean, TARP is still not done. I don't know if legislatively that can be done or uh, however, but uh, uh, I think it is a great injustice to thousands of uh, people. And we, our job is to, again, try to be fair to those folks. I would be glad to work with uh, you and others of uh, both uh, sides of the aisle to see what we could do with that. Well, we, Mr. Turner and I have been working on this for a long time, and we welcome that opportunity as well as the HCTC uh, extension okay. for the next year, because a lot of the, these folks are um, having huge, huge health care exactly. costs as well. So I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman, and let's, let's make something happen. Okay. Uh, any additional questions? No, just thank you. Uh, Mr. Turner, additional questions? Great. Thank you. I have three. And I, I do want to acknowledge Mr. Ryan's <coughs> dedication and, and uh, just hard work on this. This has been uh, really a, a, a team ball project here and a bipartisan project. Um, Robbie Andrews is being another, uh, of course, on the other side of the aisle. Uh, and certainly in the Senate, there are a couple others. And uh, on follow up to my congratulations to Mr. Ryan, thanks to Mr. Ryan, I, I unfortunately had to step out. Um, and, uh, have, and, and while I was gone, Mr. Ryan asked a question to Mr. Ratner. And so I'm going to paraphrase, not having been in the room, your answer, and I'm going to ask you to, to, uh, to, to say it again and elaborate it on it so that I can understand it. Um, he was discussing with you the termination of the salaried pension plan, and you indicated that you had had considerable discussion on the termination of the salaried plan. Is that a correct accusation of what occurred when I was not in the room? I'm not sure what discussion. I'm not sure with whom you are thinking we had discussions. Perhaps you could tell. Well, first off, did you have any discussions with respect to the termination of the salaried pension plan? Yes. And those discussions occurred prior to its termination. Correct. Who did you have those discussions with? I had one or more discussions with Fritz Henderson, who was then the CEO of General Motors, and we had a number of discussions among the auto team members. So you spoke to Mr. Feldman? I believe so. Yeah. So, so when I asked Mr. Feldman whether or not he would had any discussions and he didn't recall it, you do recall having had a conversation with Mr. Feldman with respect to terminating the salary pension plan? I, I thought Mr. your Wilson? question to Mr. Feldman was in the context of the PBGC. Have you had any? Did you recall having discussions with the PBGC with respect to termination of the plan? 
I don't recall. <clears throat> would you say that, um, that you, I mean, would, would you deny that you did? I said I didn't recall. So you don't recall whether or not you did also, or didn't, right? That's I mean, you correct. could have. I, I could have, but I don't okay. recall. Well, luckily, with the subpoenas that have been issued, we are going to get even more of the information, because Mr. Feldman had no recollection of his discussion with respect to termination of the pension plans until I handed him his own email. And, Mr. Ratner, I look forward to addressing that issue with you again, with, with perhaps your, your own emails. Mr. Wilson, one of the issues in the GAO report um, is this concept of the uh, conflicts of interest, the multiple roles of Treasury is, I think, the heading in the report. And we talk about Treasury having a, um, you know, the, the Treasurer on the board of PBGC. Uh, we have Treasury as TARP, purchaser of GM. We have the yeah, Auto Task Force, Treasury. Uh, we have many of those. You have left the Auto Task Force. You have left any role at Treasury. But it is my understanding are you were subsequently appointed to the PBGC Advisory Committee, is that correct? I was uh, recommended by Senator Mitch McConnell's staff to the White House that ultimately decided to appoint me as a uh, representative of the people at large. So was that a, a yes? I didn't understand it. Yes. Okay. Are you still on the PBGC Advisory Committee? Yes. Okay. Uh, Ms. Romero, um, thank you for the clarity of your answers among what at times becomes a heated and a, um, a um, obtuse, uh, 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 I don't know, the, uh, where the answers here are, are not always the, um, uh, the, the clearest. Um, on your report on page 29, you state that the audit, um, in the audit, you state that after the decision was made to not make the salary retirees whole, Dr. Summers prepared a briefing memo for President Obama in August of 2009. Can you tell us who Dr. Summers is? Um, Larry Summers was the, uh, one of the heads with Secretary Geithner of the Auto Task Force. I, just, I know it is in the report. I just wanted for the clarity of the record for it to be stated. Um, was this memo provided to you or your staff? Uh, we were provided access, but not, we were not given the memo. So you have seen the memo? No, I have not seen the memo. Um, someone on your team did see the memo? Uh, someone on my, I should say this. Someone on my team saw a draft of an email that contained the memo. Do you, do you know what was in the memo? Uh, yes. Could you tell us, please? Sure. Um, a, a Delphi salaried retiree had written a letter to the President to describe his personal situation. The President had asked his advisors for information about um, the situation. The memo discussed uh, how um, this person would um, receive less benefits uh, on their pension, how there um, was, it describes the 1999 agreement, the spinoff of Delphi. It describes um, how uh, dis discussions between the UAW and GM in 1999. It then discusses how, uh, as part of GM's bankruptcy, the top-up for the UAW uh, retirees uh, would be given, um, but not for the salaried employees. It discusses uh, that the salaried employee retirees did not have leverage because they did not have current workers at GM, um, and it also discussed how the salaried plan was fully funded by GM in 1999. Do you know who briefed the President from that meeting, memo? Uh, the, the, the memo came from Mr. Summers. I, I don't know if there was any um, verbal briefing to the President. And no action to reverse the decision came from the, the President of the White House that you are aware of after the memo informing the President that uh, the salary retirees lacked the leverage of UAW? Um, that is correct. We did not see any, any change or any action taken after the memo to the President. Ms. Romero, I am going to read something from your written statement that I, I just um, I would like you to elaborate on, because I think it really goes to the issue of the power and authority that Treasury exerted here. You say, uh, an auto team official told Sig Tarp that the auto team's approach with GM was to push them and to question them. And another one said, we pushed GM toward making the changes necessary to becoming a viable company. And uh, when asked 
how is it that this was done at the bottom of the paragraph on page um, 12, which is the third paragraph down, the auto team official said, well, they could, but then they couldn't exist. I mean, as I said, as the lender, we had a fair amount of leverage. Now, that's a constant theme throughout your report. Could you elaborate on that just a moment? Because that's, I mean, that's fairly sure. but for. Uh, GM goes away if they don't do what Treasury says. Well, I think, I think this goes to the bigger issue, and I think the best way to discuss this is to tell you what the auto team told us and tell you what GM told us. So um, Mr. Bloom told us uh, from the auto team that Treasury did not want to start running the company, but when dealing with taxpayer resources, we, the government, were ultimately holding the purse strings, and we reserved the right to tell GM we would not back them. So when we asked Mr. Bloom how the auto team conveyed its preferences or nudged GM to see things the way the auto team did, given that ultimately GM could do its own thing, that is when he said, well, they could, but then they couldn't exist. I mean, as I said, as the lender, we had a fair amount of leverage. GM officials uh, told us, um, there's a, just a couple statements. One, ultimately, it is that GM was, it was that GM is not in control and GM is totally dependent. Uh, the auto team replacing the CEO was an early indicator that Treasury, as the main investor, would have significant influence over GM's decisions and operations. GM officials told us the auto team was pushing GM to be tougher and take more significant actions other than what we would have done on our own volition, that GM put forward recommendations, but ultimately the purchaser made decisions, uh, which was Treasury. So there were a, a lot of situations that we found where the auto team um, can take the position that they did not intend to have significant influence on GM's uh, decisions and operations. But we have GM officials telling us that they felt that they were not in control and that the auto team did have significant influence on GM's decisions and operations. <laughs> so the auto team may not have intended the significant, to have significant influence, and they may not believe that they had it, uh, but they did. Now, if I could just, if I could just take two seconds, I want to read one part in, in Mr. Ratner's book, which is very much on point. This is, this is quoting from Mr. Ratner's book. Larry, meaning Mr. Summers, Larry had pushed us from the start to play down Team Auto's role and keep the emphasis on GM and Chrysler managing their own affairs. That ended up being partly true of GM in the sense that Harry, meaning Mr. Wilson, and his team tried to set parameters and assumptions for its executives in the hope that they then could produce the specifics of a restructuring plan. And he goes on to say, in reality, the talent and determination of Harry and then he names David and Sadiq, who were on the auto team, were what really drove the process. As we drafted, drafted press statements and fact sheets, I would constantly force myself to write that GM had done such and such. Just once I would have liked to write we instead. And that is what Mr. Ratner wrote. That is consistent with what we found, that the public statements Treasury made downplayed their influence, downplayed their role. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. And, uh, Mr. 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 Conley, I yield you 10 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> um, I want to come back to that in a minute. But, Mr. Wilson, uh, you objected uh, that Ms. Romero was inaccurate when she said Treasury gave leverage to the union and bondholders. You weren't really allowed to explain your objection. Please do so now. Sure. Um, there was no doubt that UAW and the bondholders had a lot of leverage, but it was not in any part as a result of Treasury actions or anyone else's actions. They were, had a lot of leverage because they were critical actors in restructuring. You need the UAW to manufacture cars, and therefore they were critical for that, and they would always be critical. And the bondholders were a critical because they were a large stakeholder, even though they had no ongoing involvement. They were critical because they could object and hold up the proceedings and cost the taxpayers lots of you know, billions of dollars in a prolonged bankruptcy that would also imperil the potential viability of General Motors. So good point you are making here, that the, the leverage they had was self-created by virtue of their power over many years. It wasn't something conferred upon them by Larry Summers or Mr. Ratner. That is correct. Um, Mr. Miller, Mr. Ratner, Mr. Wilson, Mr. Feldman, like any and all of you, but um, here is GM facing bankruptcy. Um, 
why would they choose to honor these union contracts? Could there be a good business reason to do that, or is it just because somebody somewhere said, take care of the unions? Is it at all conceivable there could be a business reason if you want to save the industry and save GM through the bankruptcy process and have them come out whole that you might want to honor that contract? I, I'm the, the issue is that without honoring the contracts, there wouldn't be any workforce. And the last time that GM, I forget the year, allowed a strike to go on, it was exceedingly expensive and almost destroyed the company. To operate and become feasible, you must have the workers who produce the product. And that was a prevailing theme, even though the negotiations were very difficult with the union in trying to get concessions. But it was it's a long history going back to Walter Ruther of a lot of adversity. But without a labor force, there is no feasibility. And as far as the GM management was concerned, if the United States of America wanted to pay everybody and, a, and GM not file a bankruptcy petition, that would have been perfectly fine. But from my observation, what the auto team was concerned about is how do you protect taxpayer money? If you are just going to open up the door and everybody is going to be paid, well, then you don't need the bankruptcy. But the bankruptcy is a zero-sum game. There is only so much value, and the fight is who is going to share in that value. And there are priorities that are commanded by the bankruptcy code, and there are business reasons why, unfortunately, from my perspective, unions have a lot of leverage. And the question is, how much money are you going to put in? From my perspective, again, the United States and Canada operated as if they were secured lenders. They were trying to protect their investment. And after all, you are talking about a company which, as people have described here, prior to bankruptcy, was too lax. They took on too much credit. They gave out too much money. Well, what this task force was trying to do is to make sure that GM stayed within the line of what would be feasible to get to a viable company. And in retrospect, and again, I invite others, uh, would it be fair to say, looking back, that actually that kind of worked out? Yes. That it was a wise business decision not to vitiate the contract or ignore it? From my perspective, yes. Mr. Ratner, uh, Ms. Romero quoted from your book uh, a conversation you had with uh, Larry Summers. Would you comment on her comment? Yeah, Ms. Romero, I don't think fully understands the difference between being involved in day-to-day -day operations and being involved in a restructuring. Uh, and she sort of tossed those back and forth without making the right distinction. We had no involvement in the day-to-day -day running of General Motors. We did not decide what kind of cars they were going to make. We did not decide which plants were going to function. We did not decide how much they were going to discount their new model. We didn't pick new models. We didn't do any. We didn't pick executives. We didn't do any of the things that one would associate with the quote day-to-day -day running of the company. The section she read from my book pertains entirely to the efforts that we made to affect the restructuring of General Motors, in which we were heavily involved. We were investing well, ultimately a total of $50 billion, I think $12 billion of it under the Bush administration, into the company. And we had a responsibility to the taxpayer to be sure that money was invested wisely. And if we had not been involved in those restructuring plans, if we had not pushed back on General Motors, if we had not insisted on a viable restructuring plan, then I would be relatively confident in saying we would be sitting here in front of you having a different discussion, which is why were you not watching over the taxpayer money? Why were you not involved in this restructuring? Why did you not insist that it was being done on commercially reasonable terms? Ms. Romero, you have heard Mr. Ratner's explanation. And from his point of view, you perhaps misread what the nature of that conversation was, namely it was focused on restructuring, not on day-to-day -day management and operational decisions. So earlier when I talked about the actions of um, what Treasury's influence was, what I did was I read quotes from Mr. Bloom, who is not here on the auto team, uh, and I also read quotes from GM officials. And I think this is what is important. And this is what I, what I was saying earlier. It may be that the auto team went into their job not intending 
to get so involved or have such significant influence on the decisions and operations of the company. And it may be that as they sit there today and look back at what they did that they don't think they had that influence. But ultimately, the only one who can say whether they felt that influence was the company itself. And what the company officials told us in interview after interview after interview after interview was that they were not in control, that the leverage was held by Treasury. And when they talk about we weren't involved in, in the selection of executives, the, one of the first things they did was Mr. Ratner went to GM and asked the CEO to resign and then put in his own replacement, his own pick of the CEO. And that CEO told us that the GM's board was very upset by that and said that the auto team had usurped their authority. And he said to us that was an early indicator that Treasury, of the, that Treasury as the investor would have a significant influence on our decisions and operations. Those are his words. So when, we, when Mr. Ratner talks about our interpretation is wrong, we aren't interpreting. We are laying out for the public all of the things that the auto team told us well, and all of the teams that GM officials all right, told us. Ms. Romero, let, let, me, let me just posit a little devil's advocate. Sure. Um, the U.S. taxpayer uh, is pumping tens of billions of dollars to save this company and for t you know, try to make sure we don't lose all those jobs and the whole, uh, whole industrial core of our economy. And, um, you know, it is not entirely unexpected that the existing GM management team watching this thinks, what a pain in the butt, who needs their interference? I will take your money and keep your opinion to yourself. Thank you very much, because we really have done nothing wrong. We're, we, we actually know what we are doing and you people don't. And they are going to resent any intrusion, any second guessing, any kind of new leadership change. Uh, that is kind of human nature. And as a taxpayer and as somebody who oversees taxpayer investments, I am not entirely unsympathetic to Mr. Ratner and his team trying to protect my interests. Now, maybe, maybe from someone's point of view, it went too far. But the fact that you are relying on GM interviews, well, I am not entirely surprised, having mucked it up to a fairly well and forced the taxpayer to bail them or let them go under, that they resent are exercising some oversight responsibilities. I mean, Mr. Conley, couldn't, that, couldn't that be the case, Ms. Romero? Oh, I think it absolutely could be the case. But I do want to point out, it is not just, um, it's not just we're relying on interviews of GM. We interviewed 84 people. We are also relying on the interviews of the auto team officials who sat here today and another auto team official, Mr. Bloom, who did not, and the statements that they said. But I, but I, I think you raise a really good point, Ranking Member Conley which is maybe that is in the taxpayer's best interest, and we are okay with that. Our point is just be transparent. Just say it and let the American people judge, like yourselves and all of us who funded the bailout, do we agree or disagree? But the point is don't hide behind roles or don't try to downplay your involvement. Just tell the truth. Because you know what? The American people are pretty smart. We know there was a crisis. We know something had to be done with GM, and we understand that their role was monumental and that they had to do something to restructure GM. If you just be transparent and tell the truth, then the American people will decide. And that is what we have done. What we did in our report, if you will see, there is not a lot of judgments in our report on this. What there is is we just told it like a story, a chronological story, put the facts out there so that the American people and all of you can decide whether you agree or disagree. Thank you. This is a fascinating story. I know we will return to it. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman thank you so much for uh, allowing me to. Uh, uh, Chairman, if I could have, have one moment. You have 30 seconds. Okay, great. Well, I, Mr. Connolly, I would just. No, I, um, I, you went over uh, your 20 seconds right now. Uh, 30 seconds. I am going to give him as, the 30 as usual. seconds, and then we will be exactly <laughs> even. So reset the clock. Give uh, Mr. Turner 30 seconds. He's determined to get I'm going to be the Federal Express delivery man here on, on the 30 seconds of speaking. 
Can, can I start while you are setting it? What I was going to say, Mr. Kelly, Ms. Romero once again has been incredibly articulate about what her position is and what she has done. And, and, and you are absolutely right, and you are both right, that she does not conflict with your conclusions or opinions. What she conflicts with is the public statements that have been made and the statements by Treasury. And that is the, the part that is disturbing, I think, to all taxpayers, is that there is one story being told and there is one that is being reality. And it is not as if they relied on interviews. They had papers and emails. Mr. Ratner, I want to give you one opportunity, because we all know that your statement about picking executives is, is not accurate. Do you want to amend that because you are under oath? I mean, and, and we know when people are speaking, sometimes they get a little carried away. If you would like to, to recharacterize that, I, I think everybody here would be very pleased. I was referring to picking executives below the CEO level. We did, obviously, it is public record, we did obviously uh, make a decision that there needed to be a new CEO. It was in the context of a commercially reasonable investment decision. Great, because I just didn't want you to be subject to perjury for saying something that wasn't accurate or truthful. Right. Thank you. Okay, I think we've uh, even missed. Well, uh, unless uh, anyone wants to go another round. Okay. Uh, well, I think everyone's had ample opportunity. I know we could go on, um, and there are additional questions. There are questions for members that are not here that will be submitted. And with concurrence of the minority, we are going to leave the record open for a period of two weeks. And I will advise the witnesses, too, that they may submit questions to you to respond, which will be part of the record, made part of the record. Uh, so we, uh, we have uh, uh, completed this uh, hearing. I thank the witnesses for their uh, participation. I thank for the members uh, for their involvement. Uh, I think it is an important issue. I am sorry that it was, was not resolved before Mr. Conley and I took over the uh, subcommittee. Uh, but uh, uh, again, we now have the report of the uh, Special Inspector General. Uh, we have additional information. If we need additional hearings to resolve pending issues, we will uh, we'll, we'll conduct that. But I promised a, a field hearing, which we conducted, and a Washington hearing as we completed uh, and got the SIGTARP report. So I thank all of you for your participation. Uh, there being no further business before the Government Operations Subcommittee, this hearing is adjourned.